on this virtual event today. Really delighted that you can join us, uh, particularly for those people uh, in the East Coast or in the US. I know it's really, really early. So thank you very much. Um, I'm Paulina. I'm the Engagement Director at the World Benchmarking Alliance. As the name suggests, through benchmarking, we hope to incentivize companies to align their practices and supply chains to achieve the SDGs and the human rights agenda. We're really, really happy to host this conversation and hugely thankful to our co-hosts at the Universal Rights Group, the International Chamber of Commerce, both of who are here today as our speakers, as well as the mission of Norway in Geneva, permanent mission of Fiji in Geneva, the permanent mission of Thailand in Geneva, and the permanent mission of Denmark to the UN in New York. So that's quite a list. And as you can hear, we're bringing together New York and Geneva UN delegations and other stakeholders around the world. Um, this speaks strongly to our ambition to focus on partnerships and collaborative engagement uh, to enable action on the SDGs and, and human rights agenda. And, and so too, um, this is our ambition for this session. So we would like to discuss with you the steps that the UN governments, companies and civil society can take to strengthen global norms for transparency and in doing so provide accountability to the private sector. With this session, we'd also like to explore the needs and best practices of protecting the rights of workers and vulnerable populations, whether it's in the workplace, the marketplace, community, and critically, of course, across supply chains. And we know this need has just been reinforced by the, by the COVID crisis that many of us are still in the middle of living through. And finally, we would also like to identify channels and solutions for stronger collaboration across sectors and, ind and industries including on looking at how we might build back better and what that really means in terms of actions. So a few words about housekeeping. Um, I'm the moderator for today. Um, I'll try to uh, make sure that we stick to time. Um, as a reminder, this event will be recorded and is considered on the record. And we would love for you to amplify our conversation online using hashtag HRC44 or hashtag HLPF. Um, and our speakers will guide us in conversation over the course of the hour. Um, we will try to leave some Q&A towards the end, um, but throughout, uh, if, you, if you have questions or comments, uh, please do put those in the chat box. Um, and you can also put up your virtual hand and uh, my colleagues will, will monitor that. And we'll, then I'll do my best to try to bring uh, your thoughts and voice into the conversation. Um, if, not, if not in the middle, uh, then towards the end. And then finally, uh, on housekeeping, uh, this is a virtual meeting, but we would like to be as inclusive as we can. So to help us do that, um, if you can put your video on, that would be wonderful, but do go on mute. And um, so before we go into, into our, uh, before I introduce our first speaker, um, a few words on maybe why we are here. Um, and this event is really interesting for two key reasons. First, uh, we're coming together at the same time as the 2020 High Level Political Forum in New York and the 44th session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. And second, we're encouraging a conversation that is focused on actionable solutions to build back better and aligning the SDGs, human rights and accountability agendas. Now, all of that together, is, that's quite an ambition and a meeting of geographies, stakeholders and agendas. But I hope you all agree that in order to incentivize greater transparency and action um, from the private sector, we do need to fundamentally transform that the way, the way in which business operates. And companies can't do it in a vacuum. And we need to work across borders and stakeholder groups. And as the WBA, we also believe it requires us to take a systems-based view of the SDGs that recognises the complexity and interconnectedness of the goals. And so for this reason, uh, the WBA is creating a movement for change. We're developing transparent, publicly available and free benchmarks measuring business performance and impact aligned to the SDGs. Our goal is that the benchmarks uh, help companies and serve as roadmaps so that we highlight gaps in performance. Um, we look at what best practice is uh, within industries and we outline opportunities for increased action. But this type of behavior uh, change requires significant and sustained influence from other actors. 
And that's why we're really focused on our alliance. Um, we're happy to say that we now have more than 150 organizations as our allies, and they come from a variety of geographies and, and sectors. Um, but I'll leave it there for as a general introduction. Um, and I'm pleased to uh, give the floor to my colleague, Shamista, and she's one of our experts on the social system and on human rights agenda. And she's here to tell us a little bit more about how we organize our work, um, including how social system fits into our overall systems thinking, and then also how we measure company performance. So Shamista, uh, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Paulina. And Pratik, if you could just pop up the slides. And I'll make a start. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so as Paulina said, in order to incentivize greater transparency, action and accountability from the private sector on the SDGs, we need to fundamentally transform the way business operates, which requires us to take a systems-based view of the SDGs. And this view recognises the complexity and interconnectedness of the SDGs. Our systems transformation framework, which builds on previous research around the need for systems thinking, outlines the seven transformations we believe the world must undergo and where business has a unique role to play in order to achieve the SDGs. So we view the systems as three concentric circles, as you can see up on the slide, starting right at the centre, so just as the SDGs place people first, our social transformation aims to put people at the heart of change so that no one is left behind as we create a better future. That is why the social transformation sits at the very centre of the framework. It focuses on respect for human rights, equality and empowerment, without which none of the SDGs can be fully achieved. It aims to ensure that human rights and human development are at the very core of corporate sustainability action, and it acknowledges that all companies have a critical role to play in ensuring social inclusion. And I'll come back to the social transformation in more detail shortly. The second layer of the model focuses on thematic transformations for which we are at different stages of development. So this includes digital, food and agriculture, decarbonisation, energy, circular and urban. And the very outer layer of the model focuses on the financial system, which has a dual role to play. First, in transforming itself to become more aligned with the SDGs from an impact versus risk mitigation lens. And second, in mobilizing the capital needed to enable the other six transformations. Each of these systems will include benchmarks focused on the performance of companies within specific sectors or industries. If we can move to the next slide, Pratik. Great. Across all the systems, we've identified the 2,000 companies that are the most influential in potentially contributing either positively or negatively to the achievement of the SDGs. These include public, private and listed companies that span over 70 countries from Algeria to Vietnam and make up half of the entire global economy. A quarter of those companies are based in developing, emerging and frontier markets and with their supply chains, the 2000 companies represent a truly global footprint. The list of companies sets out those that we will assess and rank by 2023 through our benchmarks. And in order to ensure that people are at the very heart of change, WBA has committed to assess all 2000 companies on a social element. If we could move to the next slide. So how does WBA propose to do this? Firstly, WBA proposes to assess the 2000 companies against a common set of core social expectations that all companies must meet to be responsible actors. They will act as responsible business conduct hurdles, which companies must clear to be given credit for their contribution for the SDGs. So a quick example of how this would work is a company that is contributing to the digital transformation by facilitating digital access, supporting the development of digital skills and applying responsible data protection practices should not be given full credit for their contribution to the SDGs if they do not respect their employees' right to, for example, freedom of association and collective bargaining and don't pay living wages. This approach, we think, will also help us identify SDG washing. Moving to the second level, 
WBA proposes to apply a social lens to the other six transformations, assessing companies on sector-specific social issues that must be addressed to enable a transformation. For example, within the food and agriculture transformation, we are likely to assess companies on managing water and land rights of smallholder farmers. This ensures that the transitions from the current system to the desired systems are just transitions that leave no one behind. And moving to the third level, WBA will develop benchmarks that provide deep dives into specific social issues. And that's what we call spotlight benchmarks. WBA has already developed two of these such benchmarks. The corporate human rights benchmark is one example that assesses human rights performance in high-risk sectors. A gender benchmark is another example that will be published in the coming months that focuses on gender equality and women's empowerment in the apparel industry. We are also exploring what spotlight social benchmarks we should develop in the future to address systemic social issues. And some areas of initial interest include race equality, income equality, and shareholder business models. If we could move to the final slide, Priti. Great. Coming back to the core social expectations that all 2000 companies will be assessed on. The first element of the model that I just discussed as you'll see on the slide, we have prepared a list of 15 topics against which we propose to assess all 2000 companies. And this list was developed based on extensive research. The expectations, as you'll see, range from the key elements of business and human rights, such as human rights due diligence, to areas such as anti-corruption, corporate taxation and lobbying. We are currently in the consultation phase for our social transformation, and we would love to receive your input on the model we have proposed to use to assess the 2000 companies, as well as on these core social topics that are up on the slide. So please reach out to us using the email address that's on the slide to get your input in. Your input is critical to ensuring that transparency from and the accountability of the private sector on human rights and SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Shamista. Um, there's, a, there's an awful lot of information um, across our sound systems of the 2000 companies and Shamista has given uh, <coughs> an outline of it, of it only. Um, and for anyone who wants to know more, please come, come back to us after and we can, we can share more details. Um, but I think the key thing to, to know, um, as Shamista pointed out, is we are currently consulting on our methodology of the social system and we would love to hear from everybody, um, whether it's through the virtual conversations that we'll be holding or um, on a one-to-one -one basis. So again, if, if, you, if you would like to um, get involved in that, um, uh, please do so. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce our next uh, speaker, who is Mark Limon, um, who's the ex Executive Director of the Universal Rights Group. And he's going to talk us through some findings of a world made new beyond COVID-19 to a low carbon, resilient and inclusive world. Um, uh, over to you, Mark, um, and for another um, uh, presentation of, of findings. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's very nice to be here. Um, thank you to all colleagues for being here with us and for co-organising it with us. Um, you, you touched on it actually at the beginning when you said this is uh, a joint HLPF Human Rights Council side event. Um, and actually that's, maybe it's just because I'm a bit of a UN geek, but that's actually quite exciting. And I'll explain why it's quite exciting because I think it's uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of how far we've come over the past two or three years in linking these two agendas. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to use my seven or eight minutes to talk about the nexus between uh, human rights and sustainable development, uh, because that underpins obviously a lot of today's discussions and uh, like from the excellent presentation we've just heard underpins the World Benchmarking Alliance's work as well. Um, and then we'll lead into how that discussion or debate on the links between human rights and sustainable development have fed into the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic response and recovery uh, efforts, uh, which is where the, um, the, the URG report written by Edward Cameron comes in that you mentioned a few seconds ago. Um, 
about building back better, basically. Um, so firstly, then this two part presentation, firstly, the human rights, uh, sustainable development nexus. Um, and as I alluded to a few moments ago, it's really incredible how far we've come um, over the past two or three years on this. Uh, people, I think, these days don't realize that this used to be an incredibly controversial uh, subject area, especially in places like the United States, uh, because it touched on this uh, issue of the so-called right to development and the UN Declaration on the Right to Development. Um, so whenever, basically, it is be very quick, whenever there were any debate at the Human Rights Council about the relationship between development and human rights, it always descended into a fight between the, uh, the, I would say, the liberal West and the big uh, developing countries, or, or even small, as I said, China, Cuba, Pakistan, Egypt, and others, who were very strong advocates of the so-called right to uh, development. Um, and it was against that background that the Universal Rights Group a few years ago started working with Denmark and Chile, and latterly a, a wider group, to try and bring uh, an initiative to the Human Rights Council uh, on human rights and the SDGs, which basically took the view that this shouldn't be <laughs> controversial. This is kind of self-evident that these two, human rights and sustainable development, are two sides of the same coin. Um, and that initiative led to resolutions at the Council um, at the same time in parallel organizations like the Danish Institute for Human Rights came up with excellent uh, groundbreaking research which showed that over 90% of the SDG targets are grounded in human rights law um, and that all fed in, in eventually into a first consensus resolution which was renewed uh, two years later uh, this June um, and basically now we're in a situation where this is kind of accepted logic at the Human Rights Council uh, we've just seen, as I mentioned, a, a, consent, a fairly straightforward consensus resolution uh, last month at the last session of the Human Rights Council, which renewed the, the mandate to hold these annual meetings on human rights and sustainable development. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, you will have all seen, who's, I think, been brilliant on this subject and has really made it one of her priorities in office. The Secretary General, uh, if you, any of you have read his recent call to action on human rights, chapter one was basically uh, human rights and the SDGs. And of course, more systemically, this nexus between human rights and sustainable development is basically the underpinning of the Secretary General's development system reforms. Uh, especially of the resident coordinator and UN country team reforms, which it has huge implications. Uh, so I think we should all kind of recognize how far we've come, but of course, as always with the UN, recognize how far we still have to go. Uh, one of those areas, and that's why I'm so happy about today's side event, is linking Geneva, in a sense, with New York and the High Level Political Forum. That at, at first, we had the impression, at least in Geneva, that we were try we were kind of making progress here, but there was still a lot of resistance in New York to any effort to bring human rights into development discussions, basically. Um, and I think this high-level political forum is the first one where I've really felt as though uh, we're successfully pushing back against that um, reaction on the part of some states. Um, this event, of course, is one example of that. I've noticed there are many side events, actually, at this year's High Level Forum that are looking at the different human rights aspects of the SDGs, including one looking at how human rights implementation should be used as a way to power progress towards the SDGs. So really, I think we're on the verge of something important here. Um, and so, uh, you know, congratulations to everybody, but uh, we still have a lot of work to do. So this basically pos re relatively positive picture of linking human rights and the SDGs, of course, at the beginning of this year, spilled over into uh, debates about how to respond to and recover from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we, the Universal Rights Group, took a number of steps in that regard. We organized a series of webinars called Right On, 
uh, which looked at these questions. Uh, and we also published, as you mentioned, the report, A World Made uh, New by Edward Cameron. Um, the write-on uh, discussions, which included the High Commissioner and the ASG and various other people, I guess one of the key conclusions uh, was that human rights and sustainable development, leaving, well, the SDGs leaving no one behind, and they're the crucial words, were crucial, provide a crucial framework to governments about how to respond and understand COVID-19 uh, and the crisis around it. And here I'm talking especially, of course, about non-discrimination and equality. Uh, the idea that the, the virus may not discriminate, but its, it's social and economic impact certainly do. Um, and that, of course, that basic understanding, which again, you know, sounds pretty boring and basic, but I think at the beginning, um, you know, it was a really an important moment for the UN human rights system and also the, the development system when the Secretary General really put human rights up front in his proposed responses to uh, COVID-19. Um, and he wasn't alone, the High Commissioner, the head of the World Health Organization, they all did. Um, and then perhaps even more importantly, especially for today's discussion, and this is my last point, is the role of human, right, the human rights and sustainable development nexus in recovering or building back better, um, as it's known. Um, the report to World Made New really focuses on the importance of state uh, recovery packages and recovery funds uh, to make sure that those recovery funds don't just take us back to how it was before, which is what a lot of the recovery funds uh, did during the last, uh, the, after the last financial crisis, but really to make sure that the funds uh, allow the society, but also business uh, to build back better by, you know, paying a fair wage, um, by making sure that business activity or economic activity contributes to environmental protection and a better climate rather than detracts from those things. Uh, that there's no corruption, there's no tax avoidance, the good example of the latter point being Denmark's um, recovery package and, and a furlough scheme, which of course refused to give uh, money to any companies that were domiciled in tax havens and a few other countries followed suit. Um, so that a world made a new mainly focused on those recovery packages but we've also started doing a lot of work about the role of business which I don't have enough time to talk about now but during the question and answer we can and really I guess the basis of our thinking on this is very similar to the, the slide uh, presented by the World Benchmarking Alliance a few moments ago, which is that we need to think more holistically about the responsibilities of business. Of course, the tradition at, at the Human Rights Council, which is already an important step forward, is to focus on business and human rights uh, in a fairly narrow sense. Um, but what we increasingly think, and this has been uh, strengthened by COVID-19, is in a similar way that we've got states to think about human rights and SDGs and environmental protection and climate change and anti-corruption together, we need to start making businesses think about those things together as well. Uh, something which I've kind of, for the purposes of the project, we're now going to start on this. I've termed comprehensive corporate responsibility. Um, which is understanding that all of these different things, human rights, uh, sustainable development, anti-corruption, climate change and human rights, business uh, responses or actions are should be mutually reinforcing across all of those areas because they're overlapping. Uh, and I think if we are to build back better, that has to be central to the understanding of what we do. And I was pleased to see on the slide that that's seems to be the, the approach of the World Benchmarking Alliance, except I think I didn't, I didn't see anything about the environment or climate change, but maybe that's a point for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, you very eloquently put how we're bridging geographies and bringing together uh, different agendas and, and how how it hasn't happened that much before and, and I, 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 
personally taken it in to to how Geneva and uh, New York UN functions actually maybe haven't always been that close together. So um, <clears throat> thank you for highlighting that. Um, and we've also so we've had um, two presentations about the need to come together and bridging bridging all of those uh, agendas and and um, the convergence between the high level political forum and now the human rights council and and i would we have a a, a speaker from the international chamber of commerce later and and i um i look forward to that uh, and we can start to explore more about the role of business mark that you uh, you mentioned and the conditionality um, that is uh, that is absolutely critical in how we build that better. Um, but before we go to the ICC, I'm really pleased to turn to um, uh, to the to hearing a response from the from the UN. Um, so uh, we have Lena uh, Wendland, uh, who's the Chief of Business and Human Rights Unit at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, thank you for joining us and for giving us your um, we've talked about the convergence um, and here you are. So um, wonderful to have you with us and, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to, to be here. I just want to check, can you hear me okay? Because I've had some problems with my headset recently. So just we checking. can hear you. There's a little bit of um, kind of stat static noise. Um, okay. Probably from your headset, but we can hear you. All right, I'll try and uh, I'll try and speak loud and clear. Um, so thanks again for the invitation, and I'm of course also extremely pleased um, with this sort of trying to build bridges between Geneva and New York. Uh, an important aspect of the business and human rights um, agenda is the issue of policy coherence, and I often find that um, that the UN we should uh, we should be first um, in that regard, and we are often failing. So. Um, an initiative like this is certainly a, a good way to try to, to build um, that coherence. I was uh, intrigued by Mark's um, response about um, or comment about the HR in the sort of narrow sense and how um, there are now excellent initiatives underway to start thinking about expanding. I mean, we're certainly very happy to engage in those discussions and also um, are making the linkages both ourselves as the UN Human Rights Office but also the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights exploring there. Just the Working Group is just presenting a report now on, on business and human rights and corruption and the links that have been reported to gender, to SDGs, etc. So we certainly see the BHR agenda not as, uh, as something that is a narrow, confined space, but one that needs to be a relevant component of many of the the, the pressing uh, and interrelated um, issues that, that the world is facing and that is, is present also in the human rights domain. So we very much look forward to being a part of that discussion and bring to the table the work that is, is, um, has already been ongoing. Um, I wanted to touch upon a, a number of things that have already been re uh, referred to. Um, um, in, notably, of course, and starting with, I think, uh, any time these days, we need to talk about the impact of COVID um, and the, the impact of the pandemic on business and human rights activities or business activities have been extensively debated. Uh, the impact of COVID and related state measures, including lockdowns um, over national economies, have been unprecedented. Um, and in facing this challenging context, we have witnessed how business companies around the globe have sought to limit the negative consequences of the pandemic to alleviate their, the impact on their balance sheets. As we know, this has led to a massive wave of dismissals and the worsening of working and living conditions in far too many places um, you know, that are part of global supply chains. In some countries and in some sectors, such as mining, um, the continuity of operations for the sake of economic benefit have put workers at risk um, and even host communities. But we have also examples that go in the opposite direction, um, in the direction of responsible business conduct. Um, some businesses have reacted to COVID often in times by going beyond government requirements uh, and have put workers' rights, uh, health considerations and livelihoods uh, support at the forefront. We have seen um, uh, a change in business culture in some companies um, that have supported new forms of work and formulas uh, for work-life balance. And we have seen a revival of um, initiatives that have helped governments fight the pandemic um, and supported those vulnerable 
vulnerable groups that have been um, hardest hit um, both in terms of health and economic impact. So what does the BHR agenda, the business and human rights agenda, have to do with all of this? And importantly, how does the current context uh, affect the potential contribution of business corporations to the implementations of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs? Um, in answering that, I just an important reminder that the UN Guiding Principles, um, which next year will celebrate its 10th anniversary, and there's a big uh, project that was launched yesterday to, to start a process of, um, of celebration, about including and taking stock and, and looking into the next decade. But the UN Guiding Principles provide the global framework uh, to define the responsibilities of business corporations in relation to the potential human rights impact of their activities. This is a complex and challenging issue, of course, um, but the key message of the guiding principles is basically that business should do no harm. Um, needless to say, business can and do bring positive human rights impacts too, but the global standard that is set out in the UN guiding principles is one of risk identification and management. So prevention, identification, prevention, mitigation, and accountability for um, human rights impacts. And this perspective is also enshrined in the 2030 agenda. There's no doubt that this agenda reflects the flavor of our times regarding the increasingly relevant role of the private sector in sustainable development. This trend has also been increasingly seen um, also in multilateral and bilateral corporation policies as well as in uh, development finance. Emphasizing the role of business is also part of the renewed attention in the three pillars of sustainable development as it's now understood, environmental, social, but also, um, and after all, the economic um, dimension. But the incorporation of business in global development efforts is not unconditionally, uh, unconditional. Interestingly, it's only in the only paragraph in the 2030 agenda devoted exclusively to business, paragraph 67. In that uh, paragraph, the world government uh, praised the role of private uh, businesses drivers of productivity, economic growth, and job creation. And they committed to foster the business sector, but at the same time uh, to protect labor rights and environmental and health standards in according with relevant international standards and agreements. And these include the new and guiding principles, which are cited explicitly along with ILO standards and the UN um, Convention on the Rights of the Child. So there is that uh, sort of uh, two layers to, to, to the role of business in this agenda. And um, so it's one of there is a lot of positive contributions that are possible, but it has to be framed and underpinned by uh, global standards of, um, of, of responsibility, including when it comes to human rights. And looking at the 2030 agenda in times of COVID um, is a powerful reminder. One, that business are essential for the recovery and for getting back on track in the implementation of the SDGs. But secondly, that corporate responsibility efforts are more than welcome in order to help workers, communities, and governments navigate the many challenges involved in this recovery. But third, the best contribution that business can do um, to sustainable development is to avoid negative impacts on people that should be at the center of this development. So in other words, uh, doing no harm while business contributing to, um, to addressing um, challenges and, and doing good. So what is the expectation of business? Um, it's relatively simple. They should first and foremost avoid doing harm over the labor rights of their workers and the workers in the value chains. Labor rights are human rights and the UN guiding principles are explicit in reference to the Isle of Fundamental Rights as a normative framework that should guide companies, um, human rights due diligence. Um, companies should be guided by those standards and avoid benefiting from potential loopholes in national legislation or putting pressure um, and externalities down in their value chains. Uh, secondly, business should avoid doing harm uh, to the communities in the where they operate. So through due diligence processes, stakeholder engagement, uh, participation and consultation, protection of human rights and environmental defenders against reprisals, and effective grievance mechanisms are the key instruments in how responsible business should operate. Many of these instruments have suffered uh, the strain of COVID responses and business cost-saving efforts, and they should now be revitalized um, without any delay as part of the path to uh, achieving the SDGs and building back, back better. Thirdly, the government business nexus is an in inextric inextricably part of the business role in sustainable development. 
while seeking to support business as part of the COVID-19 recovery, governments should not only apply their laws and regulations to protect citizens against potential harm uh, from business, but they should also use their leverage and explicitly define the human rights expectations from business operating um, in, in the jurisdiction and, uh, and seeking or benefiting from COVID-related relief. Um, Mark already mentioned the example of uh, the government of Denmark, uh, the role they have played in restricting access to financial aid. Um, and, and this really, this amongst far too few other examples is something that I think a lot of um, the, the, the positive good practice need to be identified and, and be replicated uh, across a much wider group of um, countries and, um, and, and governments. Um, and finally, uh, it's a key, we've already talked about accountability. Um, it's a key component of the international human rights framework is the right to have access to an effective remedy when your rights have been impacted. And this uh, foundational principle is reflected also, of course, in the guiding principles on business and human rights. But um, we see that far too often victims of business-related human rights abuse do not enjoy this fundamental right uh, in practice. And so to address this gap in accountability, um, the UN Human Rights Office, um, we have led a six-year project um, in the providing principles and practical guidance on how to overcome legal and practical barriers in access to remedy. And as it happens, we are today presenting uh, the two latest reports um, uh, of, of the six-year project to the Human Rights Council on the accountability and remedy project. Um, and these two reports are focused specifically on providing guidance on how to make non-state-based accountability mechanisms more effective in delivering remedy. And when I say non-state-based, well, I'm talking about um, mechanisms such as operational level grievance mechanisms, mechanisms associated with multi-stakeholder initiatives or independent accountability mechanisms from um, associated with development finance institutions, etc. So um, if we're talking about the business accountability um, for human rights, including in development and including in, uh, and not least perhaps in, in the context of, of COVID, I encourage um, everyone to, um, to check out the reports uh, that we've delivered over the course of this um, six-year project. So I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lena, um, and uh, shout out to everybody to go and have a look at the uh, the reports that your your the six year project reports that you're publishing, um, and today now there's a, there's a lot in there um, uh, that we could look at, um, but the uh, uh, role of governments in particular, um, just to say on this agenda, uh, the EU is is introducing um, uh, legislation. Um, on mandatory human rights due diligence. Um, it has been uh, evidenced by our corporate human rights benchmark over the number of years that this is a, a really an area where companies are not voluntarily moving uh, forward and making progress. So it's, an, it's a, an, an excellent example of where actually governments do need to step in and lift uh, the, the floor um, and, and where we see the agendas uh, converging. So thank you for raising the, the role of government um, in your presentation, Elena. Um, it was also a really good segue to, into um, our next speaker um, our, and our co-host, Crispin Conroy from the International Chamber of Commerce, um, where you are the permanent observer uh, of the ICC to the UN office in Geneva. Um, uh, where we're all uh, really interested to understand the, the role of business more and, and the way that the business has responded uh, to the responsibility um, uh, through the COVID um, uh, crisis in particular. And, and so I would welcome Crispin, um, uh, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paulina, and thank you for your introduction. Um, I also have a personal interest in these themes because prior to joining ICC, I worked for the Australian government and spent quite a few years here in Geneva in a previous life. I won't tell you when, because it was quite a while ago, uh, as the uh, person responsible for human rights and working to the then Human Rights Commission, not the council. So it was quite a while ago doing a lot of work on creating new human rights instruments, optional protocols, the rights of the child 
Convention, for example, and uh, declarations on human rights defenders and indig Indigenous peoples. So I'm very pleased to be part of this discussion today. Uh, thank you also for allowing us to co-partner this, this initiative. Uh, and I look forward to, to working with many of you uh, as we move forward, particularly Shamis and Mark, very interested to, to keep in touch with your uh, initiatives, which seem to have a lot of commonalities. So good to, to meet you and look forward to being in, in contact. Uh, one of the disadvantages of being one of the later speakers is that some of the points that I'm planning to make have already been referred to by others. But certainly I'd like to say that it is an important time to have this, this webinar uh, as we're entering the final dec decade of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And uh, as Lena mentioned, uh, we're reaching the final decade, uh, the, the decade uh, anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. In terms of the implementation of both, uh, clearly much more needs to be done by both governments and also by business. And as other, other speakers have said, it is important to, to have this discussion during the, the, the 2020 high level political forum and the 44th session of the UN Human Rights Council, uh, the former in New York and the latter obviously here in Geneva. And as I think, uh, Mark, you may have mentioned too often the human rights communities from these, these two major multilateral hubs seem to operate in parallel rather than collaborating. This week, we've witnessed some quite significant developments in the human rights and SDGs field. Um, Lena, you mentioned the launch earlier this week by the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights of the UNGP's 10 plus initiative with the support of the German government. And secondly, I was very pleased to participate in the webinar yesterday uh, for the launch of your, your very important report on accountability and remedy. So congratulations, Lena, to you and your, your team for that. Also during the Human Rights Council, <clears throat> and Mark, you referred to this, there was uh, the ongoing discussion on the promotion and protection of human rights and the implementation of the 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, before discussing what we might expect from companies, at least from those in the ICC network, uh, to bring to these and other initiatives, let me briefly present the, uh, the ICC, which is, I believe, useful, important to do so, so as to, dem to demonstrate really why we are a major stakeholder in this discussion and why I believe we're a relevant and constructive partner. Now, ICC is the institutional representative of over 45 million companies worldwide in over 100 countries through the network of ICC national committees and the World Chambers Federation which unites a worldwide ne network of more than 12,000 chambers of commerce and industry. ICC was established in 1919 in the aftermath of the First World War, when a number of prominent business people were working alongside political leaders in Paris to develop plans to rebuild peace and prosperity. These founders of ICC became known as the Merchants of Peace. And I only mention this history really to show that constructive engagement to contribute to the resolution of global challenges is deep within ICC's DNA. And certainly I wouldn't have joined the organization if it wasn't deep. And I believe we will bring that same spirit to our joint efforts to build a more sustainable and resilient future. For more examples of this sort of engagement, I encourage you to look at our website, but also Pavolini, you asked about uh, our collaboration with various organizations in response to the COVID crisis. And I think on the website, you'll see uh, a good example of our collaboration with WHO, uh, a very important initiative that's ongoing with partners like uh, Global Citizen, uh, International Trade Union Council, and the World Bank on Debt Relief for those countries that need it most, most uh, work with the WTO and the World um, Customs Organization and many others really helping to, to stimulate a constructive business response uh, to the COVID crisis. And our focus has been and is very much on the real economy, on supporting jobs and livelihoods uh, and SMEs, and in making concrete recommendations uh, to governments and in providing specific solutions and guidelines to our networks. <clears throat> and I think you'll see some of the partners uh, in, on the website might surprise some of you. 
uh, but it, I think it reflects the the interest of our, our leadership in reaching out to a range of different stakeholders across across a range of different uh, parts of the globe and also parts of the economy or civil society in a view to, to work together to find uh, solutions to, to these challenges. Also, I'd encourage you to have a quick look when you have time to, at the ICC centenary delegation uh, declaration, which was obviously launched last year in our centenary, because it sets out a vision for our future, but also very strong support for the implementation of the 2030 agenda, and also the sort of um, uh, inter interconnectivity of that with uh, a range of other global ch challenges, as, as Mark mentioned, I think. Finally, on, on ICC, we have a, a our headquarters in Paris, but a very active U UN office in New York, which I know Ryan and the Benchmarking Alliance know well, and a new office here in Geneva, which I head. And I would say the main driver of opening the office here in Geneva was so that our leadership could ensure that ICC had a more effective and greater voice in the implementation of the SDG agenda and uh, human rights and business agenda and on other issues such as mass, massive biodiversity loss and the challenges we face in the international trading system. I've got a, a limited amount of time, but let me touch on just uh, briefly how ICC expects to contribute to some of the initiatives that I've mentioned and that other speakers have mentioned. I, I do look forward to questions, but more importantly, perhaps to engaging with you, uh, speakers and others participating in the, in the months to come. We're very pleased to partner with the UN Working Group on Human Rights and Business, and, and uh, Lena already mentioned that initiative, uh, both the take, stock taking exercise and the strategy for the next 10 years. ICC played a pivotal role in the establishment and implementation of the UN GPs uh, with Professor Ruggi and his team. And since then, our relevant ICC commission and our uh, various officers have played a, an active role in promoting the UNGPs by states, uh, including through the development of national action plans, but also by our member, member companies. As was noted by a number of participants in the launch of that initiative, uh, much work still needs to be done in relation to implementation of the G UNGPs, including under Pillar 1, where many states have fallen significantly short of effective implementation, but also under Pillar 2, where companies clearly need to do to do better and more, and ICC commits to playing an ongoing role in this regard. We're currently discussing with the UN Working Group how ICC and our network can contribute to this initiative, and we envisage a, a number of general consultations, both in, with our commission and also regionally, but also co-hosting some, some thematic uh, consultations on specific issues such as SMEs and mainstreaming, clearly mainstreaming is one of the priority issues, but also on the nexus between human rights and anti-bribery and corruption, which uh, Lena mentioned, which is, and it's, which is already a focus of the working group. Another important issue that I believe will require increased stakeholder engagement and engagement by ICC and our network is in the development of the so-called smart mix of measures, which is envisaged in the UNGPs. Uh, which includes uh, mandatory human rights due diligence. We look forward to engaging in these discussions as it's clearly important in terms of the effective implementation of these measures that they, there is a coherent, consistent, consistent and inclusive approach. And Paulina, you mentioned the recent EC uh, Commission initiative, initiative to begin consultations on mandatory human rights due diligence within the EU. And we're certainly already in, in uh, liaising with our uh, national committees within, within uh, the EU to consider how we might engage in those consultations. Um, similarly, we'll be involved in discussions on, on measures related to non-financial reporting, which brings in some of the, the issues that, that Mark mentioned, of course. We'll also continue to monitor the discussions between governments in Geneva on the Treaty on Mandatory Due Diligence, which has been being led by Ecuador. Lena's already mentioned the, the reports that were launched and which are being presented to the Council today. Uh, thank you again, Lena. And as ICC, I know we need to do more to engage with you on that and to support you. 
and uh, you know, I look forward to working with you and your team on, on next steps. Um, as far as I'm aware, ICC has not been engaged in the previous intersessional stakeholder discussions held under the Human Rights Council resolution that you mentioned, Mark, and we certainly noticed that that resolution has been adopted again by consensus this year. Uh, I've already reached out to my colleagues in the Chilean mission uh, and we'll also meet with the, the Danish mission uh, as the two lead uh, delegations on this, this issue. But certainly I'd, I'd welcome any advice about how we might participate in the upcoming intersessional meetings, which I think there are three envisaged. Finally, the top topic of today's webinar refers to building back better. A number of previous speakers have spoken to uh, refer to this too. There must be no doubt that we can not return to business as usual. In other words, there's no way we can, we can return to business as usual. As I mentioned, ICC, earlier ICC is very focused on the current crisis still, particularly on how we support SMA, SMEs, jobs and livelihoods. But at the same time, we're developing a strategy to promote a recovery that will deliver a more resilient and sustainable future. Uh, this will include concrete tools that can be de deployed throughout our network. And in the spirit of SDG 17, this must be a priority for all of us. And I mean by that working together to develop real, real tools, concrete measures that result in a better, more sustainable and resilient future for us all. And thank you very much. Thank you, Crispin. Um, and um, there's, thank you for those. Oh, there's an echo remarks. And there's a, um, a very rich conversation also on the chat box. So thank you to everybody. I, before I introduce our, our last speaker, uh, Lena Patel, um, uh, there was a question around uh, the Global Compact and I, I just wanted to say the Global Compact is an ally to the World Bank Marking Alliance and we are working closely with them, uh, just so, so, to confirm. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I'm, I'm, it wouldn't be a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, dialogue if we didn't have uh, an input from the civil society. So I'm delighted to have Lena with us uh, from the Responsible Business Initiative for Justice, where she's the Director for Strategic Engagement. Um, the floor is yours, Lena. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be on the panel. It's been a really interesting discussion. And um, the first slide that Shell Mr. put up around the 15 areas, it was really interesting to see because criminal justice just touches on so many of those areas. So it's a uh, it's great to be part of this and I hope we can carry on with the discussions going forward. Um, a lot has changed in the past months. Covid really brought home the importance of businesses engaging in social issues. The murder of George, George Floyd and the subsequent protests, the biggest in America's history, narrowed that focus to one of the most, if not the most, pressing social issue, our justice system and the racism that runs through it. The protests added a second request on businesses to, make concrete act, to take concrete action and to be real makers of change. If we are going to make real progress on the SDGs, then we must look at our criminal justice system. Two thirds of the world's population lack meaningful access to justice. In America, 2.2 million people are in prison or in jail. Often they're incarcerated pre-trial because they can't pay for cash bail, which means they're incarcerated for just being poor. One in four black American men will get a criminal conviction at some point in their lives and are incarcerated at five times the rate of whites. We can examine these failings in the context of STG 16. For example, the target of ending violence. Systems of justice should meaningfully deter violence and make communities safer. And yet studies have repeatedly shown that mass incarceration and excessive sentences do not deter crime. Also, the principle that systems of justice must not allow for human rights violations. Yet the sentences of juvenile life without parole and the death penalty both violate international law and norms on human rights standards, and both of them are practiced widely across America. The words repeated over and over again during this pandemic are don't let a crisis go to waste, and nowhere is this more true than with justice. We have an opportunity right now to rebuild a fairer, more equitable system, but we need to bring powerful allies to the table, and we need to bring powerful leaders to our movement if we're going to make that really happen. And this is where businesses come in. We know businesses have power, 
our organization was quite literally built out of thousands of conversations with campaign leaders who when asked the question, if you could dream of an ally, ally to be on your table right now, nine times out of 10, the answer was the name of a business or business leader. It's also true, however, that many companies have historically shied away from issues like criminal justice. But the recent outrage has seen a huge change and it is now critical that businesses take a stand on the right side of history. It is also critical that their stand is impactful, going beyond press statements and instead targeting advocacy to deliver real change. But what does this look like for businesses to meaningfully engage? First, let's definitely not lose sight of using, lose sight of using your voice. Business advocacy is powerful advocacy, but real advocacy comes from working with the campaign movement. The right messaging at the right time and directed to the right audience can create serious impact. Two, businesses can use their leverage. Sometimes this is public, often it's private, but businesses come to conversations with leaders, elected officials, governments, legislators, governors with money on the table where the campaign community often does not. Three, businesses are doing great things by innovating with their products, using tech tools to communicate campaign messaging, we just did an event with Cisco where they talked about how they've adapted an employee training program to teach IT skills in prisons. Businesses can also literally put their money where their mouth is and donate. Over the last six weeks, we have seen juggernauts like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft pledge enormous sums, and the value of this cannot be overstated. Bank of America's huge $1 billion of support will go an unsurprisingly long way, and donations provide resources to campaigners and experts on the ground, people with expertise to spend it wisely. And finally, a big piece of this is building diverse and inclusive workforces. By hiring the formerly incarcerated, companies go a long way towards breaking the destructive cycles of incarceration, unemployment and reoffending that often plague our most, mo most marginalised communities, whilst at the same time tapping into a productive, loyal and underutilised talent pool. And when businesses get that, they really get why engagement on criminal justice is relevant to them and what impact they can have. We recently published a toolkit on exactly this, so if you'd like to go more, please do go to our website. Businesses being, instrument in, in, in it being instrumental in ending hate, suffering and discrimination is not theoretical. When Coca-Cola made the decision to withdraw from apartheid, they struck a major blow for racial equality in the region. Companies have the same opportunity now. When movement leaders, governments and business leaders meet at the table, we create real power. Power enough to topple a system and power enough to create real change. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. That that was so powerful, and I, I was writing so many notes uh, as you were speaking. Um, and the power of uh, the power of business to do good, but to also do harm. And I will uh, ask Mark to uh, say a few words. Um, we're, we're shortly running out of time to say a few words. Uh, in conclusion, but before we do, um, Lena, your words actually highlighted an issue that we're, we are, as the WBA, we're working on right now. Um, and I wanted to share it because it would it it seemed wrong not to with this uh, this, this discussion and this audience here. Um, you may have picked up from uh, uh, the press um, today that um, uh, there there are calls for Rio Tinto an extractive mining company uh, to be uh, suspended from the corporate human rights benchmark, which is one of the WBA benchmarks uh, that Shemissa and I uh, are both working on, um, because they um, uh, they blasted a 46,000 year old Aboriginal sacred site in, um, uh, in Western Australia. And, and this is a, an action that we can't, it's incredible that, that they have behaved in this way and um, we condemn uh, the action and we have been building on an advocacy uh, from other groups in terms of putting out a statement that condemns the actions of, of Rio Tinto in, and, and how, and how uh, their lack of judgment in, in, in the actions that they took. So here is an example of a company uh, not behaving in the manner that we would all expect it to behave. And we therefore need that, that advocacy and that voice of all of us stakeholders coming together to make sure that the, the company understands the actions it has taken, which it does, um, uh, we, we are engaging in dialogue with them, but that this 
this doesn't happen again and that um, it's it's held accountable by society and, and by all of us um, working together um, so that companies can make most of the opportunity that they have with the voice that they have, with the power that they have, with the dialogues that they have with governments and, and all the different stakeholders that we talked about here now. So it's, a, it's a, a, an example today um, and we're working with it today, which is why I really wanted to bring it into the conversation. We're early on and we're issuing in our, in our, we're early on in our dialogue with Rio Tinto, we are issuing a statement and we are considering therefore how, how we react in an agile way uh, through our benchmark to this type of action taking place. Uh, our benchmarks are annual uh, and so of course we set the methodology and we look at the company performance and practices from last year um, but uh, we also need to respond to this and then we're reviewing our methodology and going forwards in how we can take this kind of activity into account. So I just wanted to state that um, if people have questions around that um, then we're, we're working on it so please do come to us but now uh, I'm one minute over and I did promise that I would give the last word uh, to Mark Lemon um, from the URC um, but I just wanted to thank everybody for this very rich conversation and uh, we could have gone on for longer um, and I hope that we can come together again um, uh, and, and work collaboratively. Uh, Mark uh, the last word is yours. Mark, I believe you're on mute. Sorry, I've wasted 30 seconds then. It wasn't very interesting what I was saying anyway. Um, no, thank you very much uh, for giving me this, the last word. I was saying I'll be very quick, A, because I don't have a huge amount to say. Secondly, it was incredibly rich discussion, impossible to summarize in uh, just a few minutes. And lastly, we've committed the cardinal sin for a human rights council side event. I don't know if it's equally as strict at the high level political forum, but we've gone over slightly our allotted time. So if this was in the UN, we would be kicked out by now by uh, overjealous managers in, of the Palais de Nations. Um, as I said, I won't try to wrap up, but something struck me in the discussion actually, which also gives me a chance to respond to one of the questions, because I did say at the beginning, it would be nice to, to respond to the questions. Um, one of them, a very insightful question, asked about this growing call, I guess, especially in developed countries, to start repatriating a lot of uh, industries and businesses. Um, obviously, the most exa obvious example is, is uh, personal protective equipment. Um, but lots of other examples as well. Uh, this idea to relocalize, if you like, business, and what the impact of that would be on on developing countries. Uh, um, of course, that discussion, especially in Europe, is mainly focused on repatriation of key industry, strategic industries from China, uh, but it clearly would have an impact on developing countries. And so that got me thinking that when we think about uh, using the human rights and sustainable development framework and empowering or helping businesses to use that framework to build back better from COVID-19, there are two risks, and I think often we just focus on one of those risks. Uh, the first one that we have talked about before is going back to business as usual. And as our colleague from the International Chamber of Commerce said, that's not, that shouldn't be an option. We can't go back to business, review, business as usual. But I think there's another risk, and that's that we actually do harm. We actually uh, react in a way that could actually hurt um, human rights and the sustainable development prospects of people in, especially in developing countries and especially in least developed countries and small island uh, states. Uh, and that we should always remember that we, we mustn't do that. Uh, we obviously mustn't do that. So then the question is how, and this is my last point before I let everybody go. I think there are two ways. One of course is the more, let's say hard law, um, options. So somebody mentioned this this new convention, uh, which I don't support, by the way. But anyway, it's it's there, and uh, it's it's been there for a long time now. So I don't know if it will ever see the light of day. But another good, more practical example is the new French law on the duty of care. 
uh, where the French uh, judicial system is essentially can hold French companies accountable for human rights violations, even if they or corruption, even if they happen in a, a third country. Um, but then, equally importantly, the kind of work of the World Benchmarking Alliance, the work of uh, states to implement the guiding principles, the work of the annual forum on business and human rights, all of these efforts basically not to force or to hold uh, businesses to the fire as much, but really to encourage them to start thinking about human rights and sustainable development and environment and climate and social, their social responsibilities as they operate, of course, to make a profit. Um, and clearly, therefore, you know, not to um, take steps which could undermine people's uh, rights, including um, their ability to build back better themselves and to um, secure sustainable development, leaving no one behind. So that's it, my last few words. I hope I wasn't muted throughout with all that. If I was, you were very polite because you were all nodding along. Um, I don't know if I have to give back to the host uh, to say goodbye or... No, okay, well, I will say goodbye. Thank you everybody for joining. It's been a really nice uh, chat and I hope to see you in Geneva one day. It won't be soon, but maybe one day. Goodbye. Thank you so much everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.